religious freedom. The true quest of religion is not only to bring wisdom into a devotee's life, but also serenity, peace, joy, and most of all, concern and service to humankind through compassionate insight. Yes, they understand the dangers of temptations, they comprehend the consequences of neglecting the spirit and the defiance of honesty. They know the forces of ignorance and indifference. They face the trials and tests of faith, but they hold still and are not shaken, nor do they give in to corrosive doubt and insecurity. Therefore, they are not given to outright defiance and contempt for the uninitiated, nor do they condemn the unenlightened or scorn the merely ignorant. They practice the dictates of their innate conscience. The real practice of the truly devout is to live by example, to demonstrate the verity and benefits of their religious conviction through their behavior, their manner of treating people and way of speaking with them. They do not judge others for their errors, but seek out the good in all. Even in the face of danger or under the threat of death, and in spite of fear, they remain committed to their persuasion. This is not always the case. All religions have adherents of a more violent conviction, known as fundamentalists. These radicals make a point of outright condemnation and preemptive judgments of unbelievers who are considered to be deviant and members of any religion but their own. They do not hesitate to accuse, oppress and even murder those who are of a different persuasion in the belief that to do so demonstrates their virtue and true adherence to the true faith. This is the dogmatic approach to religion, harsh, uncompromising and prejudiced. The zealots uphold themselves as the true and righteous followers of their God and believe that they are even the agents of the will of God. They brook no arguments against their convictions and in their defiance increase their confidence in their righteousness. A closer examination brings a different verdict to mind. Why do they need to persecute, oppress, condemn those who do not conform to their beliefs? Why must they go as far as to even murder those who do not adhere to their religious conviction? Could it be their way to deal with their own doubt, their own apostasy, by eliminating all traces of disbelief in others? That to convince themselves they oppress and terrorize others? What impotence are they attempting to remedy with fanaticism? The very act of judging proves their own virtue to themselves, even in the case of polite negation of those who do not ad adhere to their religion, confirms their own good faith, their righteousness, their obedience to God. Is this truly the good way? They believe so hindering or harming others for their own faith's sake brings no good to their victims, nor does it redeem their religion. These acts of virtue, in effect, alienate them from others and dehumanize those they judge. In this way, their resentment of others, not of their own persuasion, is put into practice as their faith in God, in action, through a public display of righteousness. Their claim that they suffer from the sins of the unbelievers justifies their outrageous behavior. The more they negate the sinners, the more dogmatic they become and end up as nothing more than bigots. There are those of the same school of thought whose main thrust of faith is in their taking and preaching the name of God in all their conversations and take the pointing out of their sins of others to be their duty, a sign of their goodness. They praise the dutiful and shun the sinners, 
They love nothing better than to preach on the certainty of hellfire and brimstone for all who do not repent of their sinful ways. Certain of God's vengeance on sinners and his reward for heaven, of heaven for the saved, those who conform with his laws. Planting a fatal doubt, creating a lethal fear about the afterlife, is not the best way to proclaim the benefits of worshipping God. Even worship is promoted as a duty and the only sure antidote to the threat of damnation. Thus God is presented as a tyrant who damns any who do not worship him. This is the Machiavellian interpretation of God's word, to rule by fear, where the love of God is rendered subordinate to his vengeance. This is the root of the conviction in the duty to focus on the sins of others and the shunning of those who refuse to comply, taking it that they are innately hell-bent and deserving of that fate. Thus, with the intention of promoting their religion, they bring repugnance to it and a disservice to their God. Conversely, the more converts they persuade into the faith, the better they feel and believe the best of themselves as servants of God. The exclusivity is the point, since they show no interest in any other religion except to negate them as a heresy, false, not the true church. Not even the findings of science are credible to them, and any fact which seems to contradict their beliefs is immediately scorned as false. Even the legislations of the state are opposed if rights are granted to those considered reprobate by the faithful. This kind of dogmatism does not further their cause for any other than their own kind, and any opposition or contradiction to their creed is taken by them to be persecution with themselves as victims. There are Christian radicals, Jewish and Islamic extremists too, even among the Hindus and Buddhists. In faith, in truth, no religion is entirely free of this fanatical extreme, and when it does occur, they declare independence from their origins as a new sect. For them, the end justifies the means with no holds barred. Their hatred of non-believers infuses their morality with the command to kill for God, whether by suicide bombers or by the recruitment of children forced to murder their parents as their first act in the Lord's Resistance Army, or as with Hamas in the Palestine res Resistance, who placed their own children as human shields in the firing line of the relentless Israeli forces, to name a few instances of the decline of human values. In these moments of absolute anarchy, both sides of the conflagration feel justified with murderous intent to eliminate the enemy fully in the right. Who would believe that all this trouble is the product of doubt? Doubt in one's own religion and doubt in the verity of others to follow their own inborn conscience. With the imperative to conquer their own apostasy by controlling others and thereby regain their own religion, they count it a virtue to condemn or attack whoever they consider corrupt, degenerate, sinful or worse. Religious freedom can either be the gateway to paradise or the highway to hell. Such a fine line distinguishes the difference. Such a profound consequence separates the outcome. Thank you.